Makahanya Haramita Shingyo Ganji Zai Boza Gyojananya Haramita Jishok and Gonga Gai Gudo Sai Guyagusha Viji Shifuri Gugutui. A knight in medieval Japan deserted his liege lord after long inner struggles for such an action was inconceivable according to the code of knighthood. He did it because he felt an overwhelming vocation for the Zen life. Having spent some twelve years in one of the mountain monasteries, he set out on pilgrimage. Before long he encountered a knight on horseback who recognised him, and made to strike him down, but then decided against it, as he was unwilling to sully his sword. So he just spat in the monk's face as he rode by. In the act of wiping away the spittle, the monk realised in a flash what in former days his reaction would have been to such an insult. Deeply moved, he turned round toward the mountain area where he had done his training, bowed and composed the poem. The mountain is the mountain, and the way is the same of old. Verily what has changed is my own heart. So this story takes place in medieval Japan and the knight uh, we can presume is a samurai and of course <coughs> samurais, um, so this, all this, the samurai clans um, ruled Japan for a long time um, through Japan's somewhat turbulent history right through until the middle of the 19th century uh, when a national government then took over and uh, dissolved the uh, uh, samurais or the samurai clans. But up until that time, the, sum the samurai were the, uh, uh, the, the top echelon, really, um, of Japanese society. And they lived by a very strict code uh, of conduct and a code of honour. And uh, a samurai's training, in, in some ways, had a certain amount of overlap with uh, the Zen monastic training. Um, and in fact, there was a, a, a merging together of the two uh, into what was known as Samurai Zen. Those of uh, you who have read uh, Trevor Leggett's book, The Warrior Koans, uh, the samurai about, which is about Samurai Zen, uh, will know this. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until Master Hakuin in the 18th century um, who popularised Zen and uh, made it available to everybody, really, uh, in in Japanese society. Up until then, it had really been regarded as something as a, uh, 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 for the upper echelons. And the reason for this is because uh, the samurai were particularly interested in fearlessness on the battlefield and being involved in quite a few battles, um, as they were. Um, and that fearlessness of death um, uh, was something that was highly prized and it was felt that uh, Zen training could give this to them. It may not necessarily be uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what the Zen training initially was about or what Buddhism was about, but um, in a way, uh, uh, this is not uh, something that's uncommon or unique even to Japan, uh, where people come along, they see something, uh, take it out and uh, think, yes, this is, uh, 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 this is what we want this for. Um, that happens even nowadays. But here, um, for the samurai anyway, uh, the samurai training wasn't just about war or, or the military. Um, uh, uh, the good samurai was considered to have, uh, should have an all-round education in the arts, in poetry, and should be just as dexterous with a calligraphy brush uh, as with a sword. In this particular story, though, the knight in medieval Japan may well have uh, already had some experience with Zen, we don't know, but certainly must have come into contact with it um, because he suddenly realised that he felt an overwhelming vocation for the Zen life. And in this case, what he actually wanted to do was to cross over uh, from the life of the samurai to the life of the monk, which is something different. Uh, as I said, the, uh, uh, there may well be similarities between the two lives, but the two roles are uh, distinct and quite different, all the same. Something perhaps that we don't particularly appreciate uh, is that in past times, and this is true as much for the West as it was for the East, uh, people tended to 
not move around very much generally um, but also uh, uh, the class that you were born into the profession that you were born into the family you were born into really defined who you were nowadays we're much more used to an um, individ individual sense of self but the sense of self previously was often tied to the family uh, to the clan um, and to where one was in the stratas of society Moving out of that strata uh, was difficult and for some almost impossible. Uh, for many, in fact, almost impossible. And just because somebody was high up in that hierarchy uh, doesn't mean that they were any less imprisoned by it. Uh, they may have had a better quality of life and they will have certainly had more freedoms that those, uh, than those below them. Uh, but they, were, they also couldn't move uh, uh, through it and it really dictated um, almost every corner of their lives. And certainly for the samurai who takes an oath of loyalty to the liege lord, this was something sacred, uh, quite literally sacred. Uh, one promised to uh, uh, offer one's services unquestioningly to one's liege lord. And this was a very serious vow. Uh, and whatever one did, um, one did it for the good of the liege lord, for the, for the good of the clan, uh, and certainly not for personal reasons. There's a, an interesting story on this point, actually, also told by Trevor Leggett, um, about uh, a liege lord who was murdered, and the samurai uh, from that clan set out to uh, hunt down the killer and wreak their vengeance. Uh, and one samurai, finally in the hills, caught up with the murderer, and having cornered him, draws out his sword, ready to dispatch him, uh, when the murderer turns and also spits fully in the samurai's face. The samurai immediately sheathes his sword and walks away. And Trevor Leggett, in commenting on this, said uh, the reason that he did this was that uh, the murderer had managed to make the samurai angry. Up until that point, uh, the samurai was out to, to do his duty, which was to avenge his liege lord. Uh, but now the murderer, having spat uh, in his face it now becomes personal uh, and that threat of that personal action uh, meant that it would have been better as far as that samurai was concerned uh, to sheathe his sword walk away and let the murderer escape uh, than to strike him down uh, for personal as part of a part of a personal vendetta so the the samurais actually lived really with that sense of complete and total dedication and service to someone other than themselves. And perhaps we can see, therefore, that there is a sort of mirroring um, uh, uh, with the life of the Zen monk also, who also uh, has something similar, uh, has to practice something similar. To begin with, uh, a young monk um, would be in the temple quite often, uh, either given to the temple or maybe uh, uh, the son of a, uh, uh, the incumbent priest, uh, as quite a young child, therefore, would become a monk and would learn, obviously, the ways, uh, the chanting, the zazen, life in the temple, how to behave, deportment, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then after their education is complete, um, also at, probably in their late teens, they would be sent up to the uh, training monastery and there the really intense Zen training takes place then as now and this commences with the uh, entrance begging uh, and uh, the entrance begging which is really quite famous now this starts at um, usually that the the new uh, monks coming in uh, to the temple this takes place usually in around about springtime and they will come up uh, on foot to the monastery gates and they will ring the bell and the guest monk will come out and ask them what they want and they will say to be let in because I, I would like to train pl here please and they would be told no <clears throat> no we're full and uh, then the monk would have to ring the bell again uh, and the guest monk will come out and say no you're you're too puny uh, you couldn't manage it here you better go uh, and this is uh, uh, almost quite ritualized. Uh, it happens several times. And then finally, the, uh, the new monk is allowed into the entrance hall, the porchway. 
uh, and there takes up a position sitting in Caesar, which is kneeling uh, uh, with, uh, with the buttocks on the heels uh, and the knees together uh, and having their bundle in front of them, uh, they would then lay their hands on the bundle and press their forehead onto the back of the hands. And this uh, 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 posture, this prostration, they would hold that all day. And the uh, entrance begging can go on for well, it can go on for as long as two, three days. In fact, uh, every so often, a couple of burly monks will come, uh, pick up the monk, drag him out of the gate, down the road, and toss him into the side. Uh, and that allows the monk to stretch his legs and to uh, uh, massage the muscles and allow the uh, sensation to come back, etc., to his limbs. And then he's expected to go back and resume his posture again. And then they're also they're obviously they're fed and at night they're allowed in to sleep. But as soon as they wake in the morning, they're back out again, uh, entrance begging. Um, as I say, this can go on for quite some time. And I remember Venerable Miyokioni uh, uh, commenting on this, that uh, she asked the head monk, does it really have to be so tough and so rough for them? And he said, well, it does really, because if they come in here and they bring themselves in, uh, if they bring their sense of ego, that uh, their sense of I, uh, in with them, then sooner or later uh, that's going to cause disharmony here. Uh, they'll either leave or they'll have to be asked to leave. It's, it's unpleasant for them. It's also disturbing for the rest of the Sangha. And so better that they find out at the beginning uh, how deep their commitment is. So... That was it. Uh, a very tough, very tough time. And uh, once they're inside, of course, they uh, then they have that very intensive training, which I'm sure most of uh, have read about. Uh, but there is interestingly one role, um, that of the attendant to the roshi, attendant to the abbot. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a position that's taken uh, that lasts for six months. Uh, and is considered very formative, and the attendant monk quite literally uh, has to pay as close attention as possible to the Roshi, quite literally making the needs uh, of the Roshi his own. Uh, so his own needs are completely secondary, and in that capacity learns to really empty himself out, making space for someone other than himself. And he has to watch closely, he has to see how the Roshi eats, in uh, uh, whether uh, uh, he eats certain foods a little bit more slowly because he doesn't like them so much, and if so, then the monk makes sure, sure that it doesn't go on his plate or that he gets a smaller portion, and if a certain chair or cushion is favoured, uh, then that has to be recalled too, so that every comfort uh, is provided to the best of that monk's ability. And this is considered very formative and an essential part of the Zen training. And after the six months, then he's he's put somewhere else uh, and someone new comes in. And this is because, um, again, the formation of sort of personal relationships uh, in the monastery and certainly between the Roshi and the monks is uh, uh, not considered good form. Um, that It's not that that warmth isn't there, that warmth is there. Um, but that the developing of the personal relationships, well, that's not what people are there for, uh, and it can get in the way. And, and again, that might be something quite difficult for us to really comprehend and to uh, perhaps even empathise with uh, terribly well. But those people who've been on a, on a retreat, on a silent retreat, might know uh, something quite similar. Uh, on a silent retreat, we can meet people there who we've not met before, and we're sat next to them in the zendo, and we're sat next to them in the dining room. And uh, our usual way of getting to know somebody is through talking to them. Uh, but in in the cases of a silent retreat, we can't do that. But that doesn't mean we don't get to know them, or there isn't a level of intimacy there in that silence. Actually, there there is, uh, sitting at the uh, dining table we can see if a person has tea or coffee and uh, for breakfast and whether they have sugar uh, whether they put salt and pepper on their food or not uh, and in that way we can then anticipate their needs and if obviously the sugar bowl is near me and I know that they take sugar in their coffee and they come back with the coffee then I simply hand over the sugar bowl 
uh, able to anticipate their needs. But if I'm so full of myself thinking, oh, um, I'm in pain and my knees hurt and how long is this going to go on for? And oh my God, was it, do I really want to do this? Then of course I don't see those things. So the ability to be able to really empty out myself and create that spaciousness uh, within which uh, others can be seen uh, and that service can can take place is uh, very important and um, here it's also true as well in that monastery and so we can know that for those 12 years that the uh, knight now a monk um, has been training very hard indeed this is what he really wanted to do because this was his vocation and that vocation, of course, uh, it's described as he'd, that he'd felt an overwhelming vocation for the Zen life. And a vocation, interesting, um, comes from the Latin vocare, meaning to be called. And the vocation is something that we are called to. It's not something that I choose. It's something that for the person who experiences the vocation, is, it feels is quite self-evident. Uh, and yet may actually cause them uh, to go against sometimes convention uh, and certainly can go against their own personal wishes in the, uh, in the moment. Uh, as is the case here, he, as, as it says, this night he had had long inner struggles uh, with this vocation for the Zen life because he didn't want to have that vocation. And this is the, the whole point. Sometimes we really don't want that vocation, uh, but something calls us. And this is tremendously important for the spiritual life because it comes down to our motivation, what in Buddhism is known as the bodhicitta, the aspiration for enlightenment, the aspiration for uh, liberation on the Buddha's, along the Buddha's way. Uh, 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 that vocation uh, is what pulls us along. It's what causes us to really stay put uh, when everything in me shrieks that I want to get out of here. Um, there's a story, again, of Venerable Miyokyo and is one of her teachers, the second one, Master Zwiegen, Canon uh, Zwiegen Roshi. When he, was a, when he went up to the training monastery as a young man, he had spent most of his early childhood in temples. He'd never had experience of outside life uh, because he was given to the temple at a very young age. Uh, and then it came to one of the very difficult winter sessions, retreats, uh, and he really felt it had enough. Something broke inside him and he couldn't bear it anymore. And in one of the breaks uh, between the Zazen periods, uh, he went up, climbed the ladder up into the bell tower of the monastery. And there he sat down and wept and wept. And he vowed that even though he didn't know anything else outside of temple life, he couldn't bear this anymore. And he was going. And having made up his mind that that's what he was going to do, he said he heard the uh, signal for court summoning everybody back to the zendo for the next period of zazen. He came down the ladder, went into the zendo, resumed his seat and sat himself down and sat out that session. And fortunately he did. He became a very great Zen master in his own right in time. But what is it that took him back into that zendo? Because it certainly wasn't his conscious wish uh, to do that. This is a something of a mystery, really, that we have to uh, really look into because this, these forces are in us uh, and uh, we may not always realise it. Uh, well, we do realise it, of course, once it begins to create trouble for us, once it begins to pull us in a certain direction that, that takes us out of our comfort zone, uh, just as this man had. This was his overwhelming vocation, that which calls him. Having spent his 12 years there, he then sets out on pilgrimage and going on pilgrimage too uh, in the tradition is uh, uh, also very much part of the training. There comes a time uh, when the master considers that, so to speak, one's passed the driving tests <laughs> um, uh, and one is ready to actually go out. Uh, but before one can really settle down and start teaching others for oneself, there needs to be further testing and it may well be that there are other masters who might pick up on something that the first one missed. So there's a tradition that uh, the monks after this period of time will go out under their own steam uh, and they will go and visit other training places and the masters in the new place uh, will 
question them and examine them. Uh, and if they pass, then they move on to somewhere else. Uh, if they don't pass, uh, then they will settle themselves down under that new master until the matter has been fully sorted out. So uh, this is the reason why he was going out on pilgrimage. Uh, but it's remarkable, really, because it's almost as if the Dharma had contrived something, um, having set out on pilgrimage to be tested. Uh, he encounters one of his old brother knights uh, from the past, one of the old samurai, who gives him this real challenge, this uh, very real ultimate challenge, where his life is, is very much on the line. And uh, again, uh, this is very uh, uh, important because changes can occur in us uh, and yet we may not consciously realize them. The changes and transformation that the spiritual training undertakes in us is something, so to speak, that quite often happens behind the scenes uh, and we are not directly conscious of because these are not changes that I will. Spiritual transformation has nothing to do with I and happens despite our, of, of I. Um, it's true to say, and certainly nowadays, everybody's into you know self-change and transformation and attaining potential, etc. But these are all conscious wishes. Uh, this is not, these, are, these things are not necessarily what the heart wants. Um, uh, if that vocation isn't conscious, then I can be pulling in all sorts of different directions, and many people do. Uh, the vacation uh, becomes conscious through hindsight. We suddenly realize that something is there and we hadn't noticed it before, like a new room in your home, for example, uh, or rather like uh, uh, the story of the man who discovers the jewel uh, sewn into the hem of his cloak. Uh, it's been there all the time, but, but actually I was completely unconscious of it. So the circumstances that we find ourselves in, life in other words, uh, that's the proving ground and that's also the place of insight as well uh, where we become aware uh, of what it is that's there, where we can become aware of what is there. And in this case, uh, for, for this one, uh, being a, a true samurai with a strong sense of honour uh, that's often unbending and unyielding and then when that honour has been thrown to the ground i.e. when his brother monk spits at him, it spits full in his face, he, in a flash he realises what his reaction would have been in those previous times when he himself was still a, a samurai knight. Uh, uh, he wouldn't have even had to think about it, the sword would have been out. But now all he did, he just wiped the spit away. This is the real transformation here the one that happens before thinking, the heart, is quite a different thing now. And then, deeply moved, he turned round towards the mountain where he had done his training, bowed and composed a poem. The mountain is the mountain, and the way is the same as of old. Well, yes, the mountain is the mountain in, in both senses. The mountain is, uh, from a, a human perspective, of course, all things are subject to change. We, this is Buddhism after all. Uh, but from the human perspective, the mountain has a real sense of eternity about it because it lasts so many human lifetimes. Uh, it becomes incalculable. And so for us, it can really represent something that is immovable. Hence in mythology, while, why they talk about the world mountain uh, or the axis of the world is considered to uh, uh, be based on a mountain, uh, Mount Sumeru in Buddhism, for example. Uh, that's because the, the mountain is always there. It's always there. It's just taken as a given. But also because the on the top of that mountain, of course, is where the monastery was. And uh, it was very common to build uh, Buddhist monasteries in China at the tops of mountains um, for several reasons. But uh, uh, suffice to say that that mountain is also identified with the place of training. And the place of training sees people come and people go. It sees Roshis come and Roshis go as well. Uh, so it's not the personal that rules there. Uh, it's the impersonal. 
It's the legacy and that the people who come there form part of that legacy. They contribute to it and they take something away from it. But the, the legacy itself is like the mountain too. It's immovable. And the way, the way is the same of old. Interestingly, we may think, well, the way goes back to the Buddha, but it doesn't. It goes before that, long before that. The Buddha himself said uh, that all he did was to rediscover an ancient path to an ancient city. That ancient city, of course, being the human heart, which, of course, is also eternal. We tend to think of the human heart, rather like, say, the soul or something, as being... Um, uh, 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 well, we tend to think of the human heart certainly as, as something that's mine, but it's not. The human heart is, there is only one heart, uh, and all of us individually spring out of it. And we return to it when we die as well. But the heart predates us, it's our foundation, and it's there long after we've gone and long after we've been forgotten. And yet, we've always been part of it. Uh, and the same with the way, too. That is also ancient, because there have been Buddhas before this one, and there will be Buddhas after this one too. The mountain is the mountain, and the way is the same of old. Verily what has changed is my own heart. And of course, it is my own heart that changes uh, through this lifetime. As Joseph Campbell once said, um, the human body, that grows up from childhood to adulthood. Uh, but the human heart, uh, or the psyche, um, the inner world, that's, that has to be trained. That doesn't grow up automatically. Um, and how does it grow up? It grows up by undergoing life's ordeals. Uh, life is the same uh, uh, in many ways. Um, even nowadays, we may think, oh, but you know, things are so much different now. Well, as far as how we experience life, the highs and the lows, that we experience highs and lows, that we experience dukkha, uh, this hasn't changed. If it did, then certainly a religion like Buddhism would have passed its sell-by date. Uh, and yet, clearly it hasn't. Uh, there is, Buddhism is, in, is very popular. It still speaks to people. Um, so clearly, uh, the heart now uh, shares a lot in common with the heart at the time of the Buddha, and before him, and before that one too. So verily what has changed is my own heart, yes, uh, by going into those ordeals, undergoing those ordeals willingly uh, and not being carried off by them, then that transformation takes place. It's a lovely poem. Um, the mountain is the mountain and the way is the same of old. Verily what has changed is my own heart. We'll leave it there. Yeti, yeti,